Hi, my name is Troy McGuinness. This short presentation lists my top five tips for forecasting and estimating software projects. The famous quote from George Box succinctly says that no matter how hard we try or how much money we spend, all forecasting models are wrong in some way. But being wrong doesn't mean useless. The guidance we get from a model just has to be better and cost effective against the status quo methods in use. In software development, that's a very low bar. Our industry uses flawed methods and gut instinct. Even with crude models, we should see an improvement in outcomes. Starting with some definitions about what an estimate is and what a forecast is, is important because this is a hotly debated topic, especially on forums like Twitter. We start off with a guess, and a guess is exactly what it sounds like. We get an expert in a room or a group of experts as a team, and we ask them how long or how much something is going to, to uh, cost. Now, it's not inexpensive. These experts and teams of experts are very expensive, so it's got nothing to do with cost. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get those experts to use their judgment and their experience to give us the best guess they have as a group. Now, it's got nothing to do, the word estimate has nothing to do with about the use of data. And I see this come up a lot, that forecasting and estimate, the difference is a forecast uses historical data. That's not true. Even when we ask an expert about a guess, they use their historical data, even if it's just in, in, in their thinking process, to form an opinion. When we start getting onto forecasts, we start looking at extrapolating a trend, a mathematical process of taking what's happened historically and projecting it forward as a linear or a polynomial sort of projection. So this is a, the simplest forecast we get, a regression forecast, and most tools do this pretty well, Excel, for instance. Then we get into probabilistic forecasting. And what that uses is rather than the mathematical process of the trend, it uses the distribution of history or the distribution of estimates and combines them in a way which projects forward and gives us not just the answer of a single result, but the possible values that a result could be as a, as a distribution. What values are more common than others? So with the, if there are no choices, there's no need to estimate at all. We estimate or we forecast to choose between multiple options that we have. And if the project, if we can't add staff, then there's no need to go down the process of working out uh, what, whether adding staff will be important. Also, if the cost is fixed, we have to be, you know, there's no need to estimate uh, how long it's going to take. We just need to get in and, and do, the, do the work. So estimation and forecasting helps us to apply clarity over to which option there should be. In this case, you know, the birds on the right hand side where they're delaying or deferring the, the choice by going a direction which offers two uh, alternative is the best option. The birds sitting on the lamppost or sitting on the fence and, uh, and uh, waiting. One important thing about forecasting and estimating is that it's useful to very quickly eliminate poor or uneconomical choices. We often forget the disasters we avoid, even by the minutest research or estimation about a potential option. So every time our first job in forecasting estimation should be to rule out an adverse option quickly and to celebrate that as a success. For instance, in this project, we have three options, option one, option two, and option three. Well, we can very quickly, even with the rudest of model rudimentary estimates and uh, expert guesses, we can see that option three is at least two times longer than option one or two. And there's very little difference between option one and two. So just by very quickly, what we should be trying to achieve when we're doing a forecast is to find those outliers, which are uh, a 2x, 3x, 4x, and really aren't viable to, uh, to, uh, to achieve. And then when we do have two options, like option one and two, to very quickly make a choice toss a coin, find out which option has a added benefit that the other option doesn't have. So often the quickest way to rule out options is just to know it's an outlier. And often we can just use, uh, we have to use the precision which supports the decisions quickest. For instance, we don't use inches to measure distance between towns, we use miles. And in this case, at the top, it's 47 miles to the next gas or petrol station, uh, we can sort of work out whether we an estimate whether we have enough in our current tank to make the next service stop. Um, it's good enough to, to know that we're in miles. So 
premature detailed estimation is one of the biggest causes of, uh, of waste in the software estimation process and why people detest doing it in the first place. Um, first, your first goal should be to sort of see if a decision can be made by estimating in quarters. If you still need more detail to get between those options which are within the same quarter, then you go by month and then you only go by week. We often set out when we do estimates on software projects to get it to the day uh, right from the get-go and that's just uh, laborious and wasteful. The next tip we're going to follow up here is, is that expert judgment, expert judgment is requires context. Einstein may not have been a great at giving you the recovery time from certain surgery and a surgeon although he's very clever, uh, probably can't uh, explain why some physics equations work better than others. So one point of caution is, is that it's, there's nothing about raw intelligence, which means that someone is better at, at guessing. Expert judgments requires context and practice. And it's through that practice that you get calibrated, you start seeing where you got it wrong and you start understanding why you got it wrong time and time again. And through that feedback loop, you get better at being an expert. So here's the point and here's the, the problem we have. If we do have calibrated experts, would they perform better than historical data that we're using? Because the historical data may not add up to what we think it will be. There could be an error in it. It could be captured out of context. It could be from a different team. Or we may not have it at all. So there's constantly, in forecasting and estimating, you constantly have this tension between whether to use expert guesses or whether to use historical data. And there's no right answer. So I, I look at evidence to sort of see whether uh, one, whether the expert will be more reliable than the historical data. The historical data has the benefit it doesn't have biases in it. The expert guess has the benefit that it can handle context better. You need to make your own decision as you're forecasting your projects. The other thing I see happen a lot is we get asked to do open-ended forecasts. We get asked to head out and and work out when something is going to be delivered as a date. And I'm saying that in often cases, I find great value in actually setting a goal, setting, getting the date fixed or getting a range of dates fixed. Just say we want it by the end of year. Uh, we want it by um, the last quarter. We want it by the middle of the year. Work out a plan to achieve each of those three points and then estimate the cost of achieving those. And by doing that, uh, you're going to uh, start the discussions and the negotiations around what is required to hit a certain date rather than just whether a date is achievable at all. And when you set goals, don't underestimate the power of setting these arbitrary but achievable and credible goals. They're, they're credible because you have a plan for getting there. For example, in the New York Marathon, the historical finish times, there are huge spikes just before the uh, just before common half hour and hourly uh, points. In fact, it's 1.4 times more likely that you finished at three hours and 15 minutes than four hours and one minute. People, if it's achievable and there's a plan and they understand the goal, will strive that little bit extra to uh, to, to hit those um, those nice round numbers. Uh, so what I'm saying here is, is that work out a plan and round it up or down to the nearest month. It's easier to communicate and it's likely that people will make informed prioritizations decisions earlier to hit that, hit that target. So I promised a top five list and here they are. Don't estimate if you don't have to. Very quickly work out whether there's any control points you can leverage. Uh, which would require an estimate to make a decision. Estimating the largest units practical, use miles if you can, only use inches when you have to. Use months when you can, only use weeks when you have to. Use data only when it exceeds expert judgment. Quickly work out that tension between calibrated expert judgment estimates versus historical data being in context or not. Set achievable dates that are backed by a plan so that everyone knows what they're signing up for and can work out what's needed to do to hit that plan and then track the missed assumptions in those plans, not the status of individual items. And if you do these five things, you will have much greater success uh, in your forecasted outcomes and you won't actually uh, have to estimate any work items individually. 
So that's the theory. Uh, I put this into practice a lot. If you go to uh, bit.ly slash sim resources, uh, you will be able to download spreadsheets and all sorts of resources around how to apply these techniques in the real world. Um, I thank you for your time and uh, have a great day.